At the same time King Philip's War was taking place in New England, down in Virginia there were other issues arising. Now, we're talking about the 1670s, mid-1670s. So by that point, the Jamestown colony, which had grown into the larger Virginia colony, was almost 70 years old. From the beginning, a lot of the uh, labor, most of the labor, was done by indentured servants, right? People from England who had signed those contracts with the understanding that they would come over and do the work and that uh, when their contracts expired, they would then have their freedom and have access to land. Well, there were, uh, there were a couple problems with that for those indentured servants. First problem was that most of them didn't live to the end of their contract, which again could be anywhere from five to seven or eight years. So in those early decades of the Virginia colony, uh, between starvation and disease and wars with the Powhatan Indians, a large number of uh, those indentured servants, most of them in fact, just didn't make it. Now another factor was that <clears throat> those people who had bought their labor, who had signed the other side of that contract, who got their work, knew that they only had them for a limited amount of time. That when those seven years were up, then that service was up and they'd have to get somebody else. So um, the employers really, in, in many cases, in trying to maximize the benefits from uh, the indentured servants and trying to get the most out of them as possible, didn't put a whole lot into them. They didn't invest a whole lot in uh, food and medicine, and they worked them sometimes literally to death to squeeze every last drop of benefit from them. So in those early decades of Virginia, the early to the mid-1600s, the, uh, the number of indentured servants who made it through to their indenture and got to be in a position then to own their own labor, as John Smith had promised, and to look for land, were few and far between. Now, this had started to change by the late 1600s as the colony became more and more settled as they got the hang of the local agriculture and feeding themselves essentially and after the end of that uh, uh, Powhatan war in the 1630s when they sort of leveraged the English that is leveraged their uh, their power in the region and defeated more and more tribes then there were uh, there were fewer Indian wars and fights. So all that put together led to an increasing number of indentured servants actually reaching the end of their contract. And the problem they faced then <clears throat> was that uh, when they went out to claim land, it had all been claimed already in the meantime, during those decades when most indentured servants weren't making it. So the good land had all been claimed really by the more well-to-do people. So uh, there was very little land to be had. What little land was available was the land that no one else wanted, which was usually higher up in the mountains to the west, uh, which is uh, you know, more difficult uh, to produce large crops, uh, particularly of the things that they were, they were growing, and closer to those uh, Indian tribes who were still autonomous. Um, so odds are you're not going to get any land at all. If you get any, it's going to be up in the mountains right next to the, uh, the Indians. So uh, by the 16, uh, 1670s, the situation had developed uh, in such a way that the Virginia colony was kind of becoming similar to England a hundred years earlier when there had been that population 
shift that had led to the English crown financing these ventures to get more colonies to send those landless, unemployed, poor white people to. Well, they sent them there and they uh, ended their, their work contract and now they are landless, unemployed, and disaffected and there are more of them every year as more and more of those indentured servants reach the end of their contracts. So you've got this whole whole class of unemployed, landless, poor people who are kind of ticked off because the whole promise had been they are going to be able to get land. Well, what was stopping them? Uh, the, uh, the availability of land. Now, there were still several tribes uh, that were uh, in existence in the area. Some had been uh, pushed uh, farther to the west. Some had been decimated by wars and disease. But there were still quite a few left. Um, the, the royal colony, the, uh, the royal government of the colony, did not want to be in perpetual warfare with the local Indians. The local Indians that were left were the ones that had sided with the English, that had been their allies, and that they hoped would still be their allies if there were problems with the French or the Spanish. Also, they were the tribes with whom the uh, uh, authorities, the colonial authorities, wanted to be able to trade. Therefore, it was not in the best interests of the colony or of the crown to kill all the Indians. However, those uh, unemployed poor people started agitating for that to be done. Uh, all the Indians, no matter whose side they had been on, no matter whether they were good trade partners or not, um, more and more of this, uh, um, this class, this working class that were largely out of work, wanted those Indians removed from that land to make more land available for them and people like them, which again is the reason that they came over. That's the promise that had been made to them. Uh, they weren't getting anywhere with those demands because the, uh, well, Parliament, uh, the Crown, even the uh, royal authorities of the colony had a big picture view, right? Um, there was, by this point, late 1600s, a lot of possessions that England had around the world, and it all had to be kind of kept in balance. Resources had to be allocated appropriately, and they just didn't want to always be at war with the Indians. And in the middle of all this, in the middle of all of this, a very charismatic individual came along named Nathaniel Bacon. Nathaniel Bacon was not an indentured servant, nor was he working class. He was actually uh, from a very well-to-do family in England, and he wound up moving to the Virginia colony in part because uh, he had gotten into so many uh, uh, troubles uh, back in England. His family had sent him to the uh, sent him to the colonies, and he uh, had the opinion, that because he was from such a prominent family, that he was going to get to Virginia and immediately uh, given a job at the top of the government, which didn't happen. Now, part of the reason that didn't happen was, as charismatic as he could be with crowds on an individual one-on-one -on -one level, he was kind of an a-hole and nobody liked him much. He was very uh, arrogant and very presumptuous, the governor of the colony really couldn't stand him, wasn't going to be giving him any plum assignments or jobs. And with this going on, Bacon sort of uh, joined in with the, uh, the poor people there along the frontier who felt like they had been basically cheated. They hadn't been given what they had been promised, an opportunity to advance. Well, even though he's rich, he felt the same way, right? He thought he was coming here, he was going to get this uh, uh, opportunity, and, and these advancements hadn't come through the way he wanted. So he identified with uh, those uh, former indentured servants and became their spokesperson 
as they were carrying these arguments to the royal governor. Dear sir, kill these Indians because we want their land. And things just kept getting more and more tense at one point in a letter to the uh, royal governor. Bacon wrote uh, to the governor, you care more about, quote, your dear and protected Indians, end quote, than about your own people. And eventually, 1676, this erupted into a full-scale, all-out rebellion, an uprising of colonists against the colonial government. And by colonists, I mean primarily those uh, poor colonists, uh, led by, again, Bacon, who was not a poor colonist. The uh, former indentured servants were joined in this rebellion by a lot of free black colonists. Now, how did you wind up with free black colonists? They had started importing slaves into the Virginia colony in 1619. And in the early years, uh, in the early years, the English, who had had no previous experience with the slave trade, treated those slaves kind of like indentured servants, and after so many years would set them free. And this had been happening, and so there had also been this growing class of, of free blacks in Virginia. So uh, they also uh, were, were farmers. They also wanted their own land. So they joined in with uh, the poor white guys, the poor black guys, poor white guys. Also a lot of slaves still in slavery ran away uh, from the uh, owners of the tobacco plantations where they worked, and they joined this rebel army. So in essence, so what you wind up with is, is in many ways just kind of like the ultimate American story. Uh, class warfare uh, that involves a bunch of uh, poor white people and a bunch of poor black people uh, joining together to stick it to the man, but mainly because they want to kill Indians and take their land. Uh, of course, the colonial government uh, uh, did not accede to this, and it, it, it led to actual, actual warfare. Uh, which dragged on uh, for a while, and uh, the uh, the rebels led by uh, led by Bacon did uh, perhaps better than you would expect. They at one point they seized the capital of Jamestown and burned it to the ground, and the royal governor managed to uh, make his way to a ship and escape. But he was uh, floating on his ship in the harbor, watching his his capital city burn. Uh, eventually, eventually the revolution kind of, uh, kind of petered out when they lost their leadership. And that happened when Nathaniel Bacon uh, contracted what was uh, called at the time the bloody flux uh, or dysentery, bloody diarrhea. Uh, and oddly enough, uh, he got it in the swamps leading a bunch of, of rebels to try to find some Indians to kill. Uh, the Indians had very wisely, when all this started happening, withdrawn into the swamps, which they knew really well. So Bacon and his men are just like sloshing around uh, after they burned down Jamestown, trying to find some more Indians to kill. And, and he contracted a fever and uh, died of bloody diarrhea. So I like to say that Nathaniel Bacon was unable to survive his own movement in more ways than one. Um, so the fighting still continued a little bit after that. In fact, the last hundred or so rebels that were finally decisively defeated, ending the whole thing, uh, more than half of them were of African descent. So in some ways, it is this early cooperation of working class people in colonial America. Poor whites and poor blacks working together trying to overthrow the status quo but then again you have to factor in they were wanting to kill uh, kill Indians and, and take their land. So all this led to uh, um, well led to a couple of things really. Now uh, I want to stop for a moment and point out that uh, Bacon's Rebellion 
which is something that you may have heard of before. The average person on the street, you might go through several average persons on the street till you found anyone who ha who had even heard of Bacon's Rebellion. And when you did, you might go through several more average persons before you found someone who knew anything about it. It maybe got mentioned in your middle school textbook for half a paragraph. But uh, the reality is, and this is my opinion as a historian, but it's the opinion of most American historians. Bacon's Rebellion was one of the most important events in American history. In fact, I would put it in the top five most important events in American history um, because of its impact, because of the repercussions of, of what happened. And those repercussions were almost immediate. Now, again, you had this situation where poor white farmers and poor free black farmers as well as slaves worked together they cooperated together to overthrow the powers that be and they almost succeeded even if they had succeeded you know the whole british army would have shown up but still they came pretty close they disrupted things quite a bit and the powers that be uh, didn't like that. That's bad. That's bad for the economy. That's bad for particularly the economy where it concerns the plantation owners, uh, the elites, the financial elites and the political elites who tended to be the same people. Uh, they didn't want that sort of thing happening anymore. And they immediately started taking steps to prevent it from happening in the future. And those steps included passing increasingly harsher laws about slavery, uh, including, uh, now already before this, but not too long before this, uh, the courts in Virginia had concluded that slavery is permanent uh, and it doesn't end after a certain amount of time, but other laws were passed uh, making slavery hereditary so that the children of a female slave were born as slaves. Um, also really strict laws about the behavior of slaves, what would be allowed and what would not be, and the behavior of free blacks who before this had had no restrictions on their behavior. If they were not a slave, and they were black, they essentially had the same rights as anybody else. Uh, that is coming to an end in the 1670s with these laws. Also laws that uh, uh, banned interracial marriage. Uh, all, all efforts to drive a wedge between the poor white workers and the poor black workers to keep them from ever coming together again in the way they had done on that occasion. So uh, the reason that I say, and so many people say that this was extremely important, this was the birth of race, really, in America. It was the uh, sort of the forebear of segregation and all the other racial laws designed to, uh, to sow discord among the laboring classes. And Native Americans were going to be involved in this as well. Uh, efforts were made to keep them from cooperating with uh, uh, slaves, escaped slaves, free blacks, and so forth. So uh, bear that, bear that in mind. Anytime you think about uh, uh, race, race relations in America, this was really well, the real starting point was 1619 with the arrival of those first slaves. But 1676, Bacon's Rebellion, that was a huge moment. And it was also a huge moment in the development of, the further development of the idea of westward expansion. Because what was this all about? It was all about the fact that those colonists wanted to kill more Indians because the Indians had the land and they wanted the land. And so uh, they are pushing their government 
to uh, basically sanction those those actions so they can continue expanding westward so like i said i mean this is kind of like the ultimate american story And that's going to become more obvious as time goes on. Well, Bacon's Rebellion, therefore, was a, a huge move away from the reliance of uh, indentured servants, reliance upon indentured servants for the agricultural plantation-style labor, which would mean that more of that is going to... Uh, uh, go in the direction of African slaves, which means that there are going to be more African slaves brought into the Virginia colony. Well, uh, that being said, we've mentioned slavery several times, but now let's take a closer look, let's take a deeper dive into how that whole situation started and uh, developed and what it looked like by this time. All right. Now, slavery is something that has existed for thousands of years, about four, maybe 5,000 years ever since, uh, well, really, probably since humans went beyond the point of traveling together in nomadic bands and started uh, developing agriculture and therefore permanent cities and those cities became city-states, and there was such a thing as war. Um, in the ancient world, slavery was a frequent byproduct of warfare. So in the ancient uh, Near East, Middle East, uh, Mesopotamia, uh, Babylon, Assyria, uh, ancient Egypt, there were a lot of people who were enslaved, and the way they became enslaved, for the most part, was that they were captives taken in wartime. So uh, that is a, a trajectory that continued down through the years from the ancient world to the classical world with uh, there being slavery in Greece, uh, slavery in the Roman Republic and later the Roman Empire. Large numbers of people who existed as basically someone else's property. Now, what's the difference between that and the uh, African slave trade that we've already mentioned that is going to play such a large part in uh, the Americas? Well, one big difference is that in that ancient world, lots of people would wind up being slaves, but there wasn't a specific group of people, a specific quote-unquote race, who was basically uh, consigned to be the slave people. Uh, slaves in Rome, slaves in Greece, uh, slaves in uh, later eras might be from anywhere. Uh, basically, just anybody who either... Uh, had the misfortune of living in a town that was conquered by an enemy army, might find themselves then a slave. And then over time, uh, it developed in the, uh, the ancient world that if you were in debt, you could sell yourself or one of your relatives as a slave to make up for the debt. But in those periods, what slavery looked like was that the majority of people who were enslaved as a result of, of warfare um, actually wound up being slaves of that kingdom that conquered them and uh, were frequently employed by that government to do uh, public works, you know, to uh, do things like build great pyramids and build great walls things like that. It also uh, eventually became fairly common for slaves to wind up uh, in, in the holds, the bottoms of, of ships, uh, in what's known as the galley. So galley slaves, this is before um, those technological advances uh, 
in sailing uh, when ships only could go a short distance and you couldn't really rely on the wind. So they had lots and lots of slaves down in the bottom of the boat uh, pulling oars. So that might be what happened to you. Or you might be sold to some individual or to some family. And if that were the case, uh, essentially you were like a household servant to that person or that family, depending on what your skills might happen to be. What you did not see in the ancient world, even into the Middle Ages, was a system whereby large numbers of people were captured specifically for the purpose of enslaving them, not as a byproduct when one country is invading another, but for the, uh, the express uh, purpose of getting a whole lot of slaves to then sell to large business interests like the plantations uh, to use as commercial labor, really. Uh, that's what was new and different about the African slave trade once it became a transatlantic slave trade. Now, the African slave trade itself existed uh, well before uh, Europeans got involved. In fact, uh, remember I said that uh, slavery was often, in fact, usually a byproduct of, of conquest, of war. Well, uh, when the uh, um, Arabic people spread out uh, after the uh, uh, development of the, uh, the religion of, of Islam and went into other areas, there was a lot of fighting involved there. So frequently people who were uh, conquered or subjugated would wind up as slaves. And there was an Arab slave market uh, that primarily, primarily provided household servants um, around the, uh, the, the Middle East and the, the Near East and uh, in some cases to Europeans. Although, as you're probably aware, we talked about that whole Crusades thing, there were some centuries there when the Muslim world and the uh, Christians of Europe were constantly fighting one another, and they would take one another slave, uh, take one another captive, and make one another slaves. In fact, during that period, uh, so many slaves were captured um, by the, uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, which was situated, uh, centralized in modern-day Turkey. Uh, so, many, so many people were captured in Russia and Eastern Europe, which is pretty flat, hard to defend, and easy to invade. So people who are the ancestors of today's Russians and uh, Bulgarians and, and Czechs and so forth, the Slavic people, uh, so many of them were captured and then uh, put into slavery that the name slave, the word slave in English, actually comes from Slav for the Slavic people because so many of them were captured and enslaved. But again, this was not a huge commercial enterprise focused solely on getting more slaves in order to do large privately funded projects. Okay? Um... It continued to provide um, household servants around the, uh, uh, by this point, the medieval world. There were a couple of uh, cases, I think, in uh, what is now Iraq. In the 8th century, they tried agricultural plantations worked by slaves, but they had so many uprisings that that only lasted for a few decades. And no one really tried that again for a long time. Uh, there were also some cases where a fairly large number of slaves were used in mines, as well as, as we mentioned, in ships. So here is a map of the slave trade in Africa in the medieval period into the, uh, uh, to the modern period, which starts in the 1400s. So as you can see here, most of the activities in East Africa and most of the slaves wound up being taken, uh, a large number of them, as you can see, up to North Africa, up to Egypt, up to Saudi Arabia. 
a lot of activity in North Africa there because uh, those Muslim nations of North Africa were in constant warfare with the Christian European nations just across the Mediterranean. Uh, so uh, people were on both sides being captured and made slaves. On the west coast, on the west coast there of Africa, you had a couple of uh, empires that flourished. These are African empires, uh, Ghana and Mali, um, in the 13th, 14th, 15th century that got more actively involved in selling captives to the Arab traders because they were empires and they were expanding. However, all those other areas along the coast of West Africa, uh, the ones that aren't marked, you know, by having any particular center of slavery, those areas, uh, the people were, uh, and most of them tribal, and the type of slavery that they practiced was the same thing as Native Americans practiced in North America that we talked about before, kinship slavery. Kinship slavery was what existed in West Africa when one tribe or city-state would go to war and raid another, then the people who were taken captive would wind up being slaves. And again, they would either be slaves in somebody's household or they might be sold to Arab merchants and wind up uh, as household slaves much farther north. So that's how things existed as of roughly the year 1400. So there was a slave trade. And frequently, you will hear people say things along the lines of, you know, why do white people get blamed for slavery when slavery already existed for thousands of years and when slavery was being practiced by non-white people in Africa already? Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you've wondered about that. Now, I've already kind of given a hint as to what the difference was. Um, so let's cast our minds back to this guy, Prince Henry of Portugal, and uh, this image that uh, when the age of exploration began as a result of those technological innovations in sailing, the Portuguese were the first to really take advantage of that, and they ventured out and they discovered all these islands, the Canary Islands, the uh, Madeira, the Azores, islands which had a climate suitable to grow the things that they'd been having to buy from the Far East through uh, the Middle East, right? And uh, these Canary Islands in particular, right off the coast of West Africa. So the Portuguese, as they're sailing down the coast of Africa, uh, encounter these African nations and tribes uh, that did in fact already have the practice of selling captives. So they started buying those captives. But the thing is, the thing is that uh, with the express purpose of bringing them to these islands to work on these plantations and to bring them there and work them so hard that uh, often they were worked to death and they needed to be constantly replaced. And then, then, not long after that, Columbus made his fateful voyage, and uh, Spain, in particular, wound up with all this new territory. Two continents, really. Uh, a whole hemisphere that, uh, essentially, the, the Pope gave them access to, uh, all of which needed labor. And remember, they uh, initially were using the local Indians, but then Bartolomé de las Casas and other Spaniards protested the treatment of the Indians, so they stopped using Indians as slaves as much in Central and South America, but they still needed labor. So they start buying more and more African slaves from the slave traders along the coast of West Africa, more and more and more, an increasing demand, many, many times more than had ever been asked for before. So all those, uh, all those nations and city-states in West Africa found themselves in a constant state of warfare. Constant, never letting up. 
And it wasn't over territory. It wasn't over anything that wars usually are about. It was all about capturing as many of the opposite group of people as possible to sell them for a profit uh, to this group, the Spanish and the Portuguese, uh, who want more and more and more. And so it grew. It grew into something that was huger than it ever had been or ever would have been. And the reasoning behind it uh, differed. It was, uh, well, it was private venture capitalism, essentially. Uh, the people who were setting up these plantations, individuals or sometimes corporations, not uh, the, the kingdoms themselves, as had been the case all throughout history before this. So this becomes a huge, huge operation and transforms slavery into something that was, uh, well, again, it, 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 in comparison, the slavery that existed before, even you know, in, in Africa, paled in significance. Because now, now, it has become a global commercial interest.